Well, I'm Tina Kapoor. We met briefly at orientation those a long time ago, so I, you, know, you guys probably don't remember. My, uh, I'm going to be teaching the next, the remaining three or four lectures in probability. And uh, my background, I don't know if I told you guys at um, orientation time, but my background is I got my PhD from MIT, from the Artificial Intelligence Lab, which um, I don't know if you guys have had a chance. We, we have a lot of AI lab alums here, right? Like Raj has been here, Philip has been here. Has anyone taken you over to the AI lab to visit? Uh, okay, well, maybe we can do it. I'm sorry? Oh, that's right, Patrick. You know, I, I have to figure out what exactly the politics are of MIT and Ars Digita, but... Uh, that's a tricky thing. That's a tricky vote. Maybe I can. It seems to be more the, pil the politics of Philip. Okay. Than uh, I, I think Philip is fantastic, and everybody should just leave their politics out. But uh, we'll take. You know, I'm getting taped, so I have to think about what am I saying here. So we'll. Uh... He charges for edits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? No, that's fine. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, yeah. Well, maybe we'll wander out towards uh, the end of the week, the end of next week. Yeah. And take a tour there, and you know you can all pretend to be visiting high school students, and we'll your perspective. So we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> We're very delayed, there you go. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. They have summer. You know, we have summer programs there. But um, so background to the work. What I you know what I've done is structured the rest of this class so I get to teach you about stuff I love to do, and um, unlike a lot of my peers, I really still love to do the work that I did for my PhD. In fact, um, but that's what my job is in as well. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that um, right at the start, so you'll see that what exactly are we getting into. My biggest goal for you guys for this, for the three, four lecture period we have is to be able to use probability to solve a problem that is currently a state-of-the-art problem. The solution we're going to go over here you know, is not a state-of-the-art, but it'll help you build things that are state-of-the-art. And, um, and these solutions are important enough that um, the FDA actually has made a code for it, and they pay for it. So this is in the field of medical um, image processing, but I'm going to show you it's an important enough problem. It's a real-world enough problem that people pay for it. And uh, so, there you go. They don't pay a whole lot, but you know it adds up after a hundred or so patients. Okay. And ju just to reiterate that what we're going to do is write a software solution. I'm going to present a problem to you in image-guided surgery, which is what my background is. And uh, then we're going, to write, we're going to write some MATLAB software to solve a, a, a very chunky portion of the main problem, which I hope that if down the road, if you guys ever do get interested in image-guided surgery, you will, you will know you know, where to get started in a principled manner and be able to whip out the L. Drake book, which you guys don't have a copy of, I understand. The first two chapters. I know. That, that is such a wonderful book. It is, yeah, I do. Um, I guess since Al stopped teaching it, uh, they've it's gone out of print. But it was um, I can always I took the course when he was teaching. It was one of the last one of the last terms he taught. He kept telling us he was going to retire, but uh, he kept teaching it. And um, so I can always hear his voice ringing. He was just the most fantastic professor. And I you know I'm not even going to try to do anything like what he did. Um, and uh, but I do want to point out one thing. Let me ask you one question here. Anyone know what image-guided surgery is? Do we have some medical docs in this class? <laughs> okay, you don't know, sir. All right. Because I, I remember there were at least three when we started out. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. That's. You're really just talking about uh, a representation and maybe some robotics or no. There, you know, it's very. Very interesting. I just had a conversation yesterday with a startup that's coming out of um, Johns Hopkins, which is going to be the first one after Robodoc to actually attach some, some actuation. Robotics is not a word that's used very much in medicine now because people are a little afraid of it. So a euphemism is actuation. <laughs> and that's what, um, but, I, but that's much more at the cutting edge of you know, things that are only borderline acceptable, actually putting a robot at the end of the system. But image-guided surgery, as it's it's accepted today. Five years ago, it was a brand new technology. Brand new technology. The way it's used today is um, that a, an image-guided surgery system is it's a contraption which has some software and some hardware. The hardware is typically a workstation, and there are these things called sensors. 
and they're just attachments you put the surgeon puts on their tools and the idea is that you know the, here's a neurosurgeon they've opened up someone's head or in fact they're trying to figure out where to open up the patient's head they've got what they'll do is they'll attach some you know gizmos to the patient and then using those as they're tracing out an outline to figure out where they're going to do the craniotomy because if if you guys are at all familiar with neurosurgery, the, you know, the surgeon takes a preoperative MR or a CT scan, looks at that and says, okay, the tumor is in the left parietal lobe, or it's in the frontal lobe. Then they have to figure out where exactly should I make an incision so that I can get to the tumor and resect it with as small a hole in the head as possible. Many reasons, you know, not just the fact that you don't want to make a big hole in someone's head, but just the risk of infection goes up, the healing time goes up, and, you know, and you sp the bigger the hole, the more time you spend making it and taking care of the patient, and insurance companies don't like it. Aside from all patient discomfort, there's a big... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, what these image-guided surgery systems are used for a lot is to once the patient is brought into the OR, they're lying on the table, the surgeon goes around and you know draws on where they think the craniotomy should be. And what an image-guided surgery system provides them is that as they're drawing, they're tracing a, a line around you know where they think the tumor is, on the monitor, they can see where that lies on a preoperative MR scan of the patient. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a preview here of just look at the image on the right, okay? This is the sort of image that an image-guided surgery system will generate. Can you guys see that? I know the contrast on the left is poor, but let's just focus on the image on the right. So as the patient is lying on the table, there will, uh, the surgeon can see an image like this on a monitor. And more importantly, not just the image, but as they move their tools, you know, these tools have been outfitted with these sensors so they know where the tool tip is. And as they're tracing a boundary, so as I'm just going to point out right here that if you know, a patient is lying on the table and they're, they physically go in and draw a line for you know, a circle for where they're going to make the cut, right? as they're tracing that line, they're going to be able to see the line on their display. That's going to show them what, how it relates relative to the mass that they want to resect. Okay? Now this is you would, you know, I've been doing this for now, let's say the last 10 years, seven of which I was doing my PhD, and um, the last three I've actually been practicing at a, at a small company. But I had started to take the concept of image-guided surgery for granted until um, about a week ago, or two weeks ago, I was in Montreal, and uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Canadian healthcare system, but there's not a whole lot of money in there, so people can't buy these image-guided surgery systems. Just background, these, these systems cost you know, somewhere between 100,000 and 500,000 US dollars. So only a very small number of US hospitals can barely begin to afford these. Right? So in Canada, they don't, they don't have any of these. So I went into a case, because there's a doctor there, was one of the trailblazers, neurosurgeon Dr. Gerard Moore. He, um, he showed me a case of how they conventionally do these craniotomies right now without an image-guided surgery system. And repeatedly, repeatedly what happens is that they will make a, a hole in the head. And then when they open up, look at the brain, they'll start to see, as they use ultrasound and other modalities to figure out whether the, the mass is tumorous or not, they'll, figure out, they'll see that um, the tumor actually far extends the boundary of the hole that they've made simply because it is not that easy to eyeball this problem. You know, you ha because typically, with a, if you didn't have an image-guided surgery system, all you would have is a pre-op MR, which would be on a light board over there. The surgeon is over here. You know, you have slices of the MR scan, which looks something like um, the image on the left. And uh, if you see, I'm just scrolling through slices of an MR scan. You can see the nose is to the left, back of the head is to the right. This is, a, this is a particular acquisition known as gradient echo acquisition in MR images. And um, the, the main point for you guys to, you know, the reason I put it up there is that even though you can see it as sort of a three-dimensional image here, what the surgeons, a typical conventional surgeon has available to him is, and they're all him, so there's like one woman neurosurgeon I met, but um, they, they'll just have these slices printed on film on a light board, and they, when the patient is lying down here, they just have to mentally reconstruct those images in their head, 
and figure out, okay, now I'm making an incision here. This, hopefully, this is going to go right to the tumor. All right. I was hoping, you know, some of the, the surgeons would be here to tell me just how good they are without this. Uh, <laughs> but, <clears throat> so this, this Dr. Moore that, you know, this, sorry, what was that? Surgeons are always good. Of course they are, <laughs> yeah. You, you think, you know, when I, the more I hang out with neurosurgeons, I figure that I, I really, I want them to be as self-confident, perhaps overconfident as they are, because I don't want someone to open up my head and then sort of not be sure. <laughs> like, right? Okay. You know, you're gonna make an incision, incision make it. Right. So, but when I was in, um, I, I got a taste of conventional medicine again uh, when I was at this Canadian hospital, and they showed me how you can go in and make a craniotomy, halfway through it realize that the tumor isn't where you thought it was. You have to go up, go and create a second big hole on the head. Now you've got two pieces of bone you've taken out. You know, think about it. It's like that much more healing that needs to be done, that much more infection to the patient, right? And that's and worst case is if you make an incision in the you make a craniotomy in the wrong place, and you end up taking out what you think is the tumor there. The patient goes back. You think you've done your job. The patient goes back. You know, has their seizure again, and then you say, you know, an MR is done, or typically an MR is done postoperatively, and you find out there's a tumor left. And you know, just the trauma of that on the patient and, and on the surgeon itself, you know, contrary to the jokes we're making, surgeons take, you know, it, it's all about their ego. And, it, and it's, I'm glad it is about their ego because they want to do a job as well as they can. You know, a patient coming back for a revision simply because part of the tumor was missed. It's, it's an insult to the surgeon. And I'm glad they feel insulted because they won't do it. You know. So the, these are very, um, you know, the, these, these are the sorts of things that really motivate me to stay in this field. And, and we use probability to achieve these images. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking there was a message in here somewhere that related to your class. But, um, <laughs> Can't you find a better word than probability? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. like, like likelihood? You like that? Okay. Sure. Thing. sure. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. Uh, so in the, here, here's uh, you know how this relates to this class. Um, those MR images in the final project that we do, which final meaning of starting Monday, what we do is um, I'm going to give you some MR images like the ones on the left. We're going to load them into MATLAB, and then what I'm going to ask you guys to do, and you know I'll walk you through that, is um, we will create what is called a segmentation of those images. Anybody heard the word segmentation before in this context? No? Not market segmentation, but this. Okay, so the idea is you take, if you look at the grayscale images on the left, um, you can think of that, it's a, uh, keep losing the mouse here. It's gone. Um, the grayscale images on the left don't have clearly demarcated boundaries of, you know, what is white matter, what is gray matter, where is the tumor. These are all numbers in those images between values from 0 to 256. Some of them are going to be white matter, some of them are going to be gray matter. In some cases, white and gray matter are going to have overlapping intensities. Does everyone um, know what I mean by intensity in an image? Yeah? Anyone care to take a shot and explain it? Just so, if somebody's feeling too shy. No? Are you, talking, All right. are you just talking about that scale of, of, of 1 to 256 or 0 to 256? Exactly. Or yeah. And, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So this image on the images on the left, if you just take one single slice, that is a two-dimensional array of two, the width is 256, height is 256, and each of the values in that array is a number between 0 and 255. Okay? Now, if the number is 255, it's going to appear bright in that image. If the number is 0, it's going to appear dark in that image. Okay? Th those are the intensity values that I'm referring to. Now, White matter, for example, you know, in the brain, there's the white matter and the gray matter. Gray matter is the outer cortex where all the, the nuclei are, and gray matter and white matter is the inside. So gray matter is the stuff that grows when your parents read to you when you're kids. Have you seen those uh, Nova or whatever shows where they show, you know, a child that was never read to, thin gray matter, and a child that was read to a lot, very thick gray matter. So uh, that's now, well, in order to be able to create visualizations like the one on the right, where the tumor shows, out, shows up bright green. You know, it's one single defined surface. 
as opposed to a bunch of changing intensities, which a tumor really is like. In order to be able to go from the images to the left to the images on the right, the first task you have to do is segmentation, which is to associate with each intensity level, each pixel value in your image on the left-hand side. You've got to associate a class with it. You have to say, is this brain? Is this tumor? Is this ventricles or is this blood vessels? Okay. On the right, the red are the blood vessels. The green is the tumor. Maybe you can see a hint of the blue, that's ventricles. There are deep-seated structures where there's um, cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. And the whitish-gray mass is the brain, and then there's the skin rendered over there. Okay? So in order to be able to render images like the one on the right, you have to do a segmentation or a labeling step. Okay? And that's everything that I do today is basically I want, I want us to be very familiar with the vocabulary that we're going to need in order to do the segmentation step. Uh, today, I'm basically, you know, we'll go over the vocabulary real quick. Then I'm going to spend, um, I have some MATLAB exercises that I plan just so that you guys are familiar with the terminology that we're going to end up using on Monday and Tuesday. So we'll do that today. Monday, we're going to start the project. Tuesday, we're going to finish the project. Shai just told me that we could um, continue on Wednesday morning if we needed to. So we'll see where we are on Tuesday. And if we feel that we want to spend more time on the project, which I think is going to be more fun than the exam. Well, maybe I can even talk Raj into you know, making the project in lieu of the exam or something. Fat chance. Um, so we'll do that. And what I'd like what I'd like to do is keep the lectures at 10 and start a lab at 11 if you guys are okay with that. As I will start because this is I don't think of the second part as a recitation, especially since Raj tells me that people think recitation is optional. <laughs> Because the lab is really where what we're going to do is, you know, we'll go over some theory in the morning, and then we're just going to go sit on our computers and write MATLAB programs to actually do the segmentation. Okay? Anybody who cannot make the this new lab time? No? All right. Let me know, and you know, we can always go over. We can always go over this stuff separately. Uh, let's see. So yeah, I'm just going to have two problem sets. One will start. My hope is that the the lab, the handout that I'll give you in the lab, it's going to be a bunch of exercises to go through, and that that's going to be your problem set. My hope is you're going to just be able to finish that in the lab time, so there's going to be no homework per se. And you know, the best case, of course, is that you love MATLAB, but after the end of that hour and a half, when you sit there for the next twenty and just learn all these other things about it, but it's not going to be part of the grade. All right, so here's. Um, here is the fundamental vocabulary we need in order to be able to do our segmentation problem. Okay? Some of these things, I think, maybe most of these things you guys know already from the previous lectures. Here's a candidate for a pop quiz. <laughs> Two ca oh, sure, that's just shy. <laughs> I don't know, you know. We were just starting a pop quiz with all the folks wearing our Stigita t-shirts here. <laughs> all right. So here, I'm going to go over this vocabulary. Um, and pardon me if it's repetitive, but I really want to make sure that everyone has an intuitive understanding of what these things are. Because once you start writing code for it, you need to know more than just the definition. You, know, you, you need to be one with the concept. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and I'm just going to go through all of these. Probably the only um, new ones here from the lecture are um, Gaussian and uniform PDFs. Or have you got, you've done a little bit of uniform in recitation, right? Uh, we talked about both of them. Oh, you have talked about, perfect, perfect. So we can even, uh, good, 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 good. Um, uh, Just because Chris says so, it doesn't mean everybody. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, we're going to go. Hey, hey, all right. If you could just explain those. Oh, I'm going to go over all. I'm going to go over all of these. Oh, th this is the lecture. This is the full. Oh, yeah, this is the full lecture. Um, and. Uh, so after I go over the uniform and the Gaussian, what I'm going to do is Bayes' rule that you guys have gone over many times in different iterations, that, that's one thing we really need to be one with, because that is going to be underlying your segmentation problem. OK, so I'm going to go over that, reformulate that in, ter in the terminology that we're going to be using. And if you guys have questions on all of this, today would be a very good time to ask them. And you can ask. Chris, is that? <laughs> right. whoever, whoever is nodding their head vigorously, you know you can ask them to do your problem set. Can you me for why the segmentation involves probability? 
I'm sorry. Can give me a feeling for why the segmentation problem involves probability. Okay. Fine question. Here's <laughs> here's why. The segmentation we're going to deal with is of MRI images. Okay, that's the one I've chosen. That's what's typically taken. Those are images that are, you know, someone has a brain tumor, and the image that best distinguishes different tissue is an MR image. Okay, and when you take, if you look at the physics of the MR, which I'm going to go over in a second, I'm going to give you an intuition for MR because maybe that'll be the only thing you'll remember from this lecture. But um, that's when you take an MR image and you want to look at what is, you know. Is pixel value 150 mean tumor? Okay, if that's what you want to figure out. When you look at the image, because of the way the process, the MR process itself works, there's thermal noise, there's all sorts of other noise, you can never say that pixel value 150 corresponds to this structure. So all you do is you have a model of your process, which is a Gaussian, which is why we're going to talk about a Gaussian a lot. And so you model it as a probability density function. And you say that if you know, I'm going to make a Gaussian which has a certain mean and then say that, okay, if a pixel value is 150, it has this much probability of being a Gaussian, okay, but it's also allowed to deviate from that. From, yes, or yes, or any structure. I picked a tumor, that's probably not the best example because tumors actually have the most wide range of intensity simply because there are many types of tumors. So a different structure, let me pick a different structure such as blood vessels. Okay, they're more consistent across patients. But because of the noise involved in the process, you can never say in MR, you cannot say that this intensity corresponds to this structure. All you can say is that intensity values for this structure are a probability density functions about this mean and about this variance. That's why what you need to be able to do is, if you have that information that you model into your segmentation process, you do infinitely better than saying that you know, white matter is always going to be 130 because what you'll do is you can take an image and lo add up all pixels that have value of 130. There'll be five of them, while white matter is supposed to you know, compose of at least 10%. Do you use information on the location, too? Got these fine questions here. Um, we're not going to use that here, but, but as I did in my PhD thesis, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I started, when I started working on this problem, the, the typical... Um, the typical bias was that you really want to look at the intensities and you say, does this intensity tell you what structure it is? And I hammered on that for a good five years, you know, because I figured that they're all these smart people, that's how they want to do it, and there must be, you know, somebody must have a bug in their equation, so let me find it. And then as I was starting to do that, I realized, in fact, I was interning at Mitsubishi, which is right across the street, I think that way, at Merle one summer, and um, th that's when I... Um, you know, I spent a lot of time that summer segmenting out, not brain images, but these were knee images, okay? What we were, they wanted to build a, a, an arthroscopic surgical simulator for which what they wanted to do is when some are, someone's knee MR scan comes, they wanted to know where the bone is, where the cartilage is, where the meniscus is, and have a 3D model. So in the same way that I showed you brain here, that's what they wanted to do for the knee, okay? So I started with the conventional approach. I, you know, built an intensity-based model for the bone, and it's, it's a little bit trickier than a Gaussian. It ends up being a mixture of Gaussians, but th that's a different story. And I spent the whole summer just trying to segment out knee, a bone, you know, the femur, using an intensity model. End of the summer, and I was like, okay, all I've got is this big bone, which is so obvious in this image that it doesn't even seem like it's a big problem. And I had about a week left, and I really wanted to segment out cartilage, okay? And the only intuition I had at that point is that the femoral cartilage lies right below the femur, okay? I wanted to use that information. I couldn't care less what its intensity was because in MR it doesn't even show up well. So what I did was I took three different scans of different patients and I created a spatial model. So what I did for each, for this cartilage, I went and I measured, you know, where should, if I know where bone is, where, what is the probability of cartilage being, you know, at different pixels? Is that making sense? Yeah, sure. And that, I modeled that as another Gaussian. I said that, okay, I already know where bone is. I know where all the bone pixels are. <laughs> From my previous scans, I figured out that, you know, at a distance of two, three, and five pixels, the probability of being cartilage is very high, and it sort of starts to drop off as a Gaussian. Okay? And that led to a whopping number of publications. And that was a very simple idea that why don't you use spatial information? 
And, and it's become, you know, people, it's, encode, the trick is encoding spatial information is not very easy. That's that you can do simple things like distances. But usually structures, you know, cartilage is a very nice example of it just hugs the bottom of the bone. When you start looking at tumors, for example, a tumor is not defined spatially. Now, it can occur anywhere. So if I told you that here's, you know, here's the ventricles, here are the blood vessels, here are the cortex, where's the tumor? What is the probability of this spatial location corresponding to tumor? You have no idea. So there are some problems where intensity is exactly what's going to get you the answer. But in a lot of other problems, spatial information is very, very important. We're not going to do that here. But if you decide to move into medical image processing, <laughs> come talk to me. Yeah. So that's where, um, anyone else have any questions? I realize we went off, but he started it, so. <laughs> yes. But did you also use any intensity information for the cartilage, or did you? Yes, use I used both. I used both, and that was an example in which it was very, it was a nice example in which to show off the importance of spatial information, because cartilage intensity contrast is very poor in MR. But of course, you know, if I wanted to give it a fair shot, I would have gone back and had a different acquisition done where the uh, cartilage was nice and bright. But that wasn't my point. Um, does, <laughs> yes. Does the intensity, or rather, does the decision regarding um, one point uh, affect your decision regarding a nearby point, for example? If you, if, you know, if you already made that decision. I'm telling you, is this rigged? Or the, these are just fantastic questions. They have nothing to do with my lecture here. But that, these are the real issues. You know, once you move on, we're going to do some basic stuff here in this class. But that, that's that's a great question because. That's, when you look at a pixel, if I tell you, you know, you don't know anything about these medical images, I'm just going to tell you, this is a pixel here, and it's tumor, okay? Do you know something, can you tell me something about the eight surrounding pixels? You know, what, if you have to put money down, what would you say the pixel above it is? Right? Let's say you didn't know intensity, just prior probability. Yeah. Tumor, yeah? yeah? Right? Then you could also say, well, if I tell you it's a white matter pixel, white matter next to it, right? And as you move away from it, that probability is going to drop, right? So now there are, in order to maintain the spatial coherence of labels when you do segmentation, is um, you build in what are called, spa you, know, you can call them spatial coherence priors, they're called Markov priors. And what they do is, as you're doing the segmentation, the segmentation becomes more of an iterative process. So what you do is you go off and you say, OK, now I'm just going to use only intensities to figure out what the probability. In fact, it's called what's the class conditional probability. We'll go into some of these. You've seen some of these terms before. We'll go into them a little bit more in detail. But um, the idea is you look at a pixel, you look at its intensity, and you have four Gaussians, which are telling you that you know white matter is centered around 150. Background is centered around 10. Gray matter is centered around 50. And tumor is centered around 200. Let's say you had these Gaussians, right? So you would do the segmentation in that case in an iterative manner and first say, OK, all I'm going to do is do the classification right now, the segmentation or the labeling. Classification, these are all synonyms here, based only on the intensity. Okay. Then in the next pass, what you'll say is, OK, let me assume that this segmentation is good, but I want to induce some coherence of labels. So if there are two adjacent pixels, one which has very high probability of being white matter, and then there's the next one which has sort of not very high but good probability of gray, being gray matter. You know, white and gray are 50-50. I'm going to make it a white matter simply because it's right next to a guy who really strongly thinks he's white matter. Okay? So that's what, these are all called Markov priors, and we're definitely not going to do them in this class. <laughs> but that's it. The reason people shy away from using Markov priors, typically what people will do is they'll build in what's called the independence assumption, which is that each pixel is independent. The reason for doing that is very simply that adding neighborhood information makes the computation it's much higher. Much higher, and you know, it's there there are tricks around it, and you know, I, I worked on some of those simply because you know all these questions you guys are asking were exactly the questions that I asked, except it took me a lot longer to get to them. And it was very simply, OK, I have intensity now. Can I put in spatial? I have spatial, but can I put in local coherence? Because I wanted the segmentation to look smooth. Because these structures, are, you know, they're naturally evolved structures. They're smooth. You don't see spurts of gray matter between white matter tracts. You don't, you tend not, you know, those things don't happen in nature as much. So that's all of these 
all of these pieces of information, the only price is computation. And now, fortunately, this field of image-guided surgery is booming, so a lot of funds, both by NSF, NIH, and commercial ventures have been allocated to it. In fact, um, just um, last, last month, I really, at my company, I actually released a segmentation product, and that would have been completely unheard of three, four years ago, because firstly, people didn't understand the importance of segmentation. Secondly, there was just not enough effort in making these algorithms computationally tractable so that they could run on you know, a spark station, let's say, in under two minutes. But there's interest, there's you know, funding. I, I could afford to put a person full-time on the problem saying that all we're going to do is optimize this algorithm, not just from a code point of view, but algorithmically. And I came up with fantastic results. And now, you know, suddenly, you know, I, I can bet you a year from now, every neurosurgeon will know what segmentation is simply because they, they can press a button and out come 3D models like the one that I showed you. So, any more digressions here? Mm -hmm. uh, but some of these questions, you, you guys are already on the next level of how limiting this approach is going to be. So I was going to try to tell you how great it is, but <laughs> it, it has all these limitations. But the, the nice thing is that in a probabilistic, in a Bayesian framework, you can keep folding in all this other information using priors. You know, if you want to build in a prior, in fact, the spatial information point that you brought up earlier about the location, you know, how, how to use the proximity of different structures to help you segment it. When I formulated that, um, I, I actually folded that in a prior in a Bayesian framework. And so then with prior, if you remember your Bayes rule or when we get into it, you'll see it's just a matter of simply multiplying out the probabilities, adding them and dividing them by you know, some funky number and you get the answer. And that's why I like a probabilistic uh, framework here, because the information by the very nature of this problem we're tra trying to solve here, of segmentation of medical images, there's information that bears upon it from so many different angles. And if you have a framework, a formalism, that's going to allow you to fold in every new piece of information, then your framework, you've won something by choosing that framework. Because every time, let's say you wanted, you know, if you had not chosen a probabilistic framework, you'd be going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, now my algorithm can handle intensity. How do I fold in spatial information? So that's, um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of using um, Bayesian statistics all, all the time. So um, didn't we have a statistician in this class also? Mm -hmm. Where are we? No. Is that you? Psychologist. Psychologist, statistician. All right. <laughs> uh, we're calling you a statistician. Didn't you write? <laughs> 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 all right, all right, okay. <laughs> We're more than one half. Now yeah. that we're at the next level, let's see if they actually know what any of these I know, are. I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's a <laughs> smart <laughs> well, Anticlimactic here. Okay, what's your random variable? But, yeah, so actually, um, I, if you want to venture in here, it's like, you know, I, the ba so there's, I'm giving my position on Bayesian, the Bayesian method of solving these problems, but it, you can feel free to tell people that there are other methods. I'm just not going to say. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of other methods. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay, I asked for that one. All right, back to planet Earth here. We're going to go to, I'm going to go through some of these um, terms here, and I'm going to ask you guys to um, define them just so I can feel extremely confident moving on to the next one. Anyone want to venture with a random variable? Is give me your what do you think of a random variable? It's, it's a variable in, that's some value you're getting from your experiment uh -huh. in pixel on your MR yeah. intensity value. Uh huh. Yeah. Or it could be something that's derived from it. It's it's a random variable. It can even be you know it doesn't have to necessarily do with the probability, right? It could just something it's just a function you define. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. It's a function that's defined on the domain of your experiment. Okay, and so by the way, all of these slides are on the web page. I just um, didn't print them out now, so you wouldn't know my answers here. So I'm gonna, here's an example. Could someone fill this example for me that if we have an experiment, which is two coin tosses, um, what's the sample space? We've covered the term sample space, right? Someone want to venture what is in the sample space for this experiment? So I can feel comfortable using the term sample space. It's, 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 it's. Wonderful. Uh, an example of a random variable on this space? Number of heads. Number of heads. How did you know? That's in Drake's book. 
<laughs> so I, you know, I tried to think of other intuitive random variables on this, and I came up with two times the number of hens. <laughs> so here's what we got. Okay, one, one distinction I wanted to repeat here is um, make sure everyone understands what the difference between a discrete and a continuous random variable is. Anyone? What is the big distinction between a dis when I tell you a random variable is discrete and when it's um, continuous? What comes to mind for you? Fixed number of possible values or varies over a, a, a domain. Right. Okay. Plus, yeah, yeah. But domain is the key word there. The different a discrete random variable is defined on a discrete domain, right? right? Mm -hmm. And a continuous random variable is on a continuous domain. So is that does the term domain make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. So a discrete random variable would be something which has you know which is only defined on x equals 1, 2, 5, 8, 10, while a continuous would be on the line between 0 and 10. Perfect. All right. Okay, PDF. Um, anyone care to define PDF for me? What is a probability density function? I'm not going to go into the fine points between you know, PMF and PDF. I, I assume you guys have already, you know, yeah. Most of the world doesn't even call them PMFs. I don't. I don't think I had heard the term PMF before um, I took you know the course at MIT. So I'm not going to worry about that. But the probability density function. Anyone care to define that for me? I'm not going to look at you. Anyone? Uh, just uh, intuitively, what is a what does when I tell you that this is a probability density function? Yeah, think in terms of an experiment. What does a probability density function give you if you have an experiment? probability that you'll get each of the values in the domain. Yeah. yeah. And intuitively, that it's the, the sentence that you said has an implicit discreteness with it, you know, for each event, each value in the domain. So if you have, if your domain has points 1, 2, 3, 4, signing that. But probability density function, the terminology we're using, it's with each, it can be a continuous event space. But I'm just, so exactly. Well, you know, as we get into the, the program that we write for MATLAB, I'm going to present everything to you in the continuous domain. But once you start, you know, you'll be wise to ask the question at that point that, yes, your image intensities are supposed to be continuous, but hey, you've got an image here between values from 0 to 255. So the distinction between continuous and discrete is going to blur here. Conceptually, it's continuous. And, I'm, you know, if you do ask me the question, I have a very nice canned answer for you. But it's... You're going to think, think continuous. All the functions we're going to write are going to be defined on the continuous range. So it's not that if I give you an intensity between, you know, if I give you an intensity value of 120.5, your function's going to fall apart because it's only defined at discrete values. That's not going to happen. So conceptually, everything we're going to do is continuous. But when you implement it in the program, you're going to notice that it's all discrete because we have discrete values. And if you really push it, I'll make you blur the images so you will actually have values that are between real integers. But that's, uh, we, we have made the distinction clear, and you know, we have made the distinction so far in the course, but realize that you've got to understand both, but things are going to get blurry from now on. That's very comforting, isn't it? All right, so here's we got PDF. Uh, here is a, what, when you think of a PDF, typically, if I were to ask you, you know, what are two characteristics of a probability density function, meaning what are two quantities that if you knew about, you would be able to picture, you'd be able to visualize that density, even if you didn't know a whole lot about it? Any thoughts? Total area underneath it is one. Fair, fair. I'm even looking, you know, these, I'm looking at things that actually you guys have done already, so I'm not going after area. But um, when you think in terms of a, a Gaussian, where Sorry. The mean of the variance. Yeah, Th those are the ones I'm getting at. There are many, you know, there there are many more, but these are two. Typically, that you think of these two characteristics, and in some cases they'll define the full distribution for you. In other cases, they won't. But they there are just the sort of comforting things. If you know them, you feel like you have a handle on the probability, on the probability density, and um, 
And you know, an interesting thing is most people tend to pro model a lot of processes using Gaussians very simply because you feel like you've got your hands around them just by knowing two numbers, like the mean and the variance. So the mean is also referred to as the expected value. You guys know that? Okay, so here's what, um, that's pretty good. Um, what I figured I would do next is uh, just go a little bit over the uniform PDF. Have you guys done it, uh, done the uniform PDF recently in this course, gone over it? If I put up a picture in recitation, if I put up this picture here, um, so the x is the domain of this function, the y is the probability mass, or the probability density here, I should say, and can anyone, so this look familiar to everyone? This is uniform, you know, or uniform probability density function is simply one where there are some events which have the highest possible probability and everything else is zero probability. Fair enough? Now, can I ask someone to uh, fill in what the, you know, I've said here that from zero to the A, there is maximal probability and everything after A is zero. Can I ask someone to um, tell me what the question mark there is going to be, what the value sh there should be? Okay, everybody sure why it should be one over a? Yeah. Someone want to tell me? Okay, all right. Someone want? Okay, the the probability function was one of the rules that we've done: a probability density function and a probability mass function. When we add up the values of the probabilities, when you add up the function values over the entire domain, it has to sum to one. So the probability of all events has to add up to one. So if you look here, right? A times 1 over A, we want this area under this curve to be 1. Perfect. Now, uh, one exercise I was going to ask you guys to um, help me go through here is that to make sure that we know that when there's a probability density function we have, how, firstly, I've given you a picture. Now, I want us to be able to write that down as an expression, what that is, and then use that expression to derive the expected value and the variance of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just write out here what the PDF is, and I'm going to ask for a volunteer just to go over the expected value and then someone else to do the variance. And um, simply as an exercise that, uh, you know, once you start manipulating the algebra of probabilities, it's just empowering. We're not going to use this for anything. but it's, You'll know, you know, just I want to make sure everyone knows how to write down a probability function and do its, uh, a simple integral. See, this is a probability function. Here, so here I've done the easy part. Someone want to come up here and uh, figure out here how would we go about doing the expected value? We have a probability density function here. You know this over here. Oh, thank you. Uh, all right. What I'd like to do is go from here. Now we don't need the picture anymore. Let's say, how would we derive the expected value facts? I will get you colored chalk. Okay. Any volunteers? Anyone? All right. I'll save the variance for you. Okay. Just want you guys to be able to do this because we'll definitely put something on the exam here, so you need to pay attention. <laughs> See, I have my motivational tactics shot. <laughs> uh huh. To A. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Could you tell me what? So, just for the benefit of the folks who phased out on this when we did it, you know, when we did a presentation, could you talk about what what you're doing? So, um, we're Weighing each possible outcome of x, uh -huh. which is um, uniformly distributed from zero to a, uh -huh. by its probability mass, right. which is uniform one over a. Right. So, yeah. This is a pretty easy integral to do. So we can do it in exact form. So that's uh, zero to a of x squared 2a so that's uh, 
that's a squared over 2a, so that's a over 2. Okay, right. Thank you. Just want to remind guys here if you know, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, yeah. Jeff. So what Jeff did here was he just wrote down this expression and just want to make sure I've written this one down at least once. The expected value is probability of x times x dx integrated over the whole domain. So he didn't pick this out of nowhere. You know, if you just write down this expression, so you write down probability of x multiplied by x and integrated over the domain, you should be able to work this out for any probability expression. Okay? So if, the, if you think about it, that this is giving you, you know, an answer that you could have just looked off the picture here also, right? What is the mean value of this? Zero to a, it's half of a. Okay. All right. Now, let's see. Anyone want to try? Well, someone has to try the variance. Okay. Okay. So variance. Just stand back, so I don't know how. You can calculate it with the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. Does everyone know where that expression on the right came from? Okay. I'm sorry, you went over it? That was in recitation? No. Was that in lecture? lecture? Okay. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, hey, Raj felt terrible about that, so. Uh, integral <laughs> from 0 to 1 over a of. Uh, Uh, you know, yeah. Zero to a of one over a. Yeah. X squared dx equals uh, x mm -hmm. a with a. So a squared over three minus it was one over a. Two, yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah, that's right. So over two. Minus A squared over 12, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Does anyone have any questions about this, including where the first variance came from? I know everyone nodded, but um, because th this is something you've got to be very comfortable doing from point of view of you know your general probability knowledge and the exam, is that being able to express the variance in terms of the second and the first moments. That's what these terms are called. The expected value of x, that's the first moment. Okay, that, the, if, the, if that term ever comes up, expected value of x over PDF is the first moment of that PDF. Expected value of x squared is the second moment. Expected value of x minus the mean squared, that's the variance. That's called the second central moment. Okay, so there are moments and central moments. These are additional terms you're going to hear about when, you know, if someone decides to have a conversation about PDFs with you. And, uh, but the variance is the difference between the, the, the second and the square of the first moment. Not the, and the variance itself is the second central moment. Just buzzwords. Okay? Any questions at this stage? Okay, I want you guys to be able to do this. Well, you know, I said the exam stuff, but also in MATLAB we're going to write a routine that will you'll be able, in which you're going to need to compute the the different parameters of a uniform distribution as well as being able to plot it. Okay, so I want you to be comfortable with being able to manipulate these symbols because so, you're actually going to be writing code with that. Okay, all right. Here comes the the second and the last PDF. This is the one we're actually going to be using a lot in the lab. So um, finally, we get to something that's relevant for the lab here. Um, you guys have all seen the Gaussian PDF, the, the picture for it. Right? And as I mentioned before, a natural, um, oh, ignore the y x, the y on the x axis. It's um, supposed to be an x. And um, the, the reason I'm use, introducing a Gaussian PDF here is very simply because it makes sense to model MR intensities as Gaussian random variables. For the reasons we talked about before, there's thermal noise in the MR imaging process. In contrast to CT imaging process, the 
uniform distribution that I showed you before actually represents pixel values in a CT, in a CAT scan. It's computer-assisted tomography. That's an X-ray-based imaging technology where it's much more, you can say with you know, a lot of confidence that intensity value 204 represents bone across all patients. That's something that happens in CT because there's no thermal noise effects similar to what you see in MR. Okay? So if you were modeling intensities in a CAT scan, you would use a uniform distribution. Okay? So I didn't really pull these out of a hat. It's like th there are phenomena in medical image processing that, there, that these things model well. MR, on the other hand, you need to model intensities using Gaussians here. And I put this picture up just to you know, remind you that in a Gaussian PDF, the peak occurs at, anyone care to fill in? The peak value at the mean, there you go, thank you. And the expression on the right is, um, that's, the, that's the expression for the Gaussian PDF. Everyone seen that before? This is the first time? First time, all right. Well, so if you look at, let's just you know, look at that expression for a couple of seconds to um, try to get an intuition for it. It's ignore the constant to the left, okay, the one over square root of two pi. We'll ignore this part here. We'll just focus on the exponential. So this is really just an exponential distribution. So that gives you, at an intuitive level, that tells you that this is going to have tails. You know, an exponential, distri a uniform distribution is just going to have these sharp corners. A anytime you see an exponent, you know it's going to have smooth tapering edges. Whether they're going up or down, we don't know. But then the next thing you can observe is it's a negative exponential. Okay? So what that means is, so in, if you look in the positive half of the x-axis, a negative exponential means that as you're going up in x, this is going to come down. Right? So those are, so without really knowing exactly what's in the expression on the right, just by looking at its form, you know it's something that's going to taper like that in the right half of the axis, right? That's already a lot without knowing the mean or the variance, right? So now, what, um, to, one thing to notice here is that a Gaussian is completely defined by a mean and a variance. Meaning that if I tell you that here's a Gaussian at the mean is 10 and the variance is 1, you can fully describe, you can draw for me the full picture of that PDF using that expression for Px. Right? So this is an example. It's a nice distribution where just with two parameters, you can define all of it. Right? Something I'd want you to think about is um, how about the uniform distribution? Can you fully define it with the mean and variance? I want you to think about that. Yeah, or just that that's the idea of, you know, what what is a compact distribution? Because when we're trying to solve real world problems, we really want distributions that have a small number of parameters. Because we have to pull these parameters either out of air or from some sample. So the fewer parameters, the more compact your distribution, the more likely you are to use it. Okay? So everybody loves the Gaussian because it models prop models phenomena which have a main thrust area and they sort of peter off nicely, which is which is a phenomenal number of phenomena. <laughs> All right. So here and this guy, we're going to use this to model MR intensities. In fact, to give you a preview of what we're going to do over the in our project is we're going to take. I'm going to give you four Gaussians. Okay. When I say I'm going to give you four Gaussians, what that's going to mean is I'm going to give you four means and four variances. And I'll say the first one represents white matter. The second one, second one represents gray matter. The third one represents tumor. And the fourth one represents whatever, skin. Okay? Then what I'm going to ask you to do is compute for an image what is the probability that that pixel, you know, given intensity, belongs to white, gray, tumor, or whatever else. Okay? Then I'm going to ask you to assign to it a label of the probability which is the highest. Okay, so if the probability of white matter was 0.2 and gray matter was 0.1, but skin was 0.8, you'd classify that. That is going to be your segmentation problem. That's how you're going to solve the segmentation problem. Then in the next part on the you know, second half of the project, I'm going to show you where I got those Gaussians from. You know, did I just pull them out of air? And that, the problem of figuring out what the parameters of your Gaussians should be, that's, we're going to do that using my, maximum likelihood estimation. Okay. So there, these words are a little bit bigger than what the concepts are. The concepts are very intuitive. You know, if I just left you on an island with the two MR images, how would you go about segmenting them? Most probably you would come up with a method like this. All I'm telling you is what are the formalisms that surround them. Okay. 
Well, I think, uh, oh no, there's uh, one, one last thing, yeah, the Bayes rule. Um, you guys have seen this many times before. I'm just rewriting some of the variables. The first line there is the conventional form of probability A given B that you've seen in event space, discrete space here. Second, I've just rewritten that in a probability density domain terminology. If you look at the second equation there, and I wanted to get you familiar with these, the terms, the, the labels that I'm going to be using. So I'm going to read the second line out to you. The term on the left is probability of gamma i given x. That's referred to as the posterior probability of tissue class i. Bear with me, we're going to go over this in the next two days. Okay, I'm just reading out this to you. The posterior probability of tissue class i given that the intensity is x. Okay? Tissue class, we're going to say tissue class 0 is skin, tissue class 1 is brain, tissue class 2 is something else. All right? We're going to come up with i is going to go from 0 to 3. Okay? So the posterior probability that you're seeing tissue class i at a pixel intensity x, posterior meaning you've incorporated all the information you ever had, and finally you're saying this is the segmentation label. Okay? That is written as... Let's look at the term on the right in the numerator. That's conditional. That is the class conditional probability. These are term, new terms for things you might have seen before. The probability x given gamma i. That's the class conditional probability for tissue class i, meaning that if you see an intensity level of x, okay, and you know that you're looking at white matter, meaning you know exactly which Gaussian you need to be indexing into, what is the probability value? What is the probability density function? Okay? So the posterior, again, the term on the left, posterior probability of tissue class I at intensity X is the class conditional probability multiplied by probability of gamma I. That's the prior probability. That's a place where you can encode any number of constraints you want, such as the proximity to other structures, such as you know, local coherence. We're not going to do that for this class. But what we're saying is probability that there's skin at this particular voxel is the probability that we're going to index into that Gaussian, see how likely is it to be skin, multiplied by some prior probability. If we happen to know that, you know, pixel location X, Y, Z always has to be skin, then we can encode that in our prior probability right there. And then the bottom is a normalizing constant. And, um, it's, it's really the marginal probability, and what I, the next, the next equation there just expresses what Px is. That's the marginal probability of intensity x. We'll go over these more, but I just want to put this out there so you can take a look at the slide. And if you look at the, the last equation there, I've expressed the posterior probability by substituting the actual expression for marginal probabilities in there. I'm going to say this one one last time here, and then we'll go off and do our MATLAB, is probability that skin, you know, the probability that skin is the label of, of an intensity value 100 is computed as follow. We'll look at the Gaussian for skin, and we'll figure out where 100 is on it. We'll get this first number. That's the class conditional density. Then we're just going to multiply it by this prior belief. We may not have a prior belief, but if we do know that skin tends to occur in 90% of the voxels, you know, we want to give it a little bit more weight. The probability of skin is just higher because we know that an MR image is mostly skin. It's not true, but say we knew that. Okay? So that's what we're doing here. And since it's a probability density function, since everything has to add up to be 1, you have to have this normalizing constant. So this is where you go in and compute the probability. You look up all the other Gaussians and you divide it by that. Okay? Just because this is important, because we're going to use it a lot, I want to show this to you two or three different times, and everybody's going to absorb it at different times. So th this is where this is going to be the gist of our segmentation process. We're going to be using this last expression over and over again, or maybe just once if we get it right the first time, to get to do the segmentation. All right. And this is the end of the lecture part. I don't want to give you an opportunity to disappear before recitation. So what I planned, what we would do next is um, 
We have to go through and install MATLAB. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to install it on your machines. I apologize for that. And we can, uh, if we do that process, um, for, you know, I, I think we should be done with that in about 20, 25 minutes. And then after that, we have, um, uh, there's a problem set one. This is, it's a set of exercises, 10 or 11 exercises to get you acquainted with MATLAB. And I'll be around and we'll go through them. You know, I've structured them so that basically tells you how to look for help in MATLAB to be able to solve those problems. And by the end of it, we'll be getting into writing functions for uniform and Gaussian. But a lot of them are about putting plots up, making the axes are right, and um, just getting you familiar with MATLAB because starting Monday, we're going to use it a lot more. TA should be around too uh, during the lab. Perfect.